Hey, you guys, just wanted to let you know we have an amazing show called The Game Changer Show each and every single Wednesday at 6 p.m. GMT, where we interview uh, entrepreneurs, athletes alike. Uh, It gives people uh, an an opportunity to listen to people's story, how they made some, how they've kind of uh, really turned their business around. Uh, It's fun. It's thought provoking. It's an opportunity to ask questions uh, and it's interactive. So if you want to come uh, and hang out with some cool people, uh, 6 p.m. PM, please go to uh, youtube.com forward slash sleeve forward slash Adam Strong. Uh, subscribe and click on the bell, and we'll see you there on Wednesday at 6 p.m. GMT. Cheers. Take care. This is the Game Changers Experience. Deep dive conversations with leading business disruptors, Olympic athletes, celebrities, entrepreneurs, and influencers from around the world. This show will teach you insights about the winning principles in mindset, productivity, marketing, branding, entrepreneurship, business strategy, and more. Hosted by Productivity Authority, business strategist, former elite athlete, author, and public speaker, Adam Strong. Great to have you on here, Elia. I know we've been trying to pin you down for quite some time as you're such a busy individual these days, especially being on Clubhouse. And <laughs> which is great. And obviously being a giraffe as well, because I tell you what, that must be yep. hard work. That is, that is hard work. I think we should probably qualify why I'm dressed as a giraffe. I think the people watching this probably hopefully are wondering why and not just accepting it as normality, because then 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 I'd be worried if people are like, oh, he's wearing a giraffe outfit. There's a point <laughs> to it. Maybe it's worth qualifying that. Should we should we discuss it? Yeah, let's do that because I <laughs> I'm actually intrigued because, like, I know that your message kind of changed a couple of months ago. And I'm like, what the fuck is all about, you know, being a giraffe? I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> but come on, intrigue me. I'm like, I'm like, I know that people want to stand out. I know you want to stand out, Elliot. You know, we want to be like the, the, in the spotlight. But giraffe, come on. Tell me. Well, listen, it's quite interesting how that come about. And apparently the dog is a friendly dog. So that's good. The way it came about is last year, towards the end of the year, we did some research with our database and, you know, some, some you know, we sent them a survey and they responded. And, and the key results were mainly that people really wanted to rise above the noise. They wanted to be heard in their own voice. They wanted to stand out. And I was having a conversation with my content girl and I had this little giraffe. It's up there. I'm not going to reach it, but it's like one of those ones you buy on holiday and it looks terrible. It is terrible, but you know, you buy it or my wife buys it for some reason. And I grabbed it. I went, you know what? People want to be more giraffe. And she's like, what do you mean? Well, they want to stand out. They want to rise above the noise. Like they want it. Like you see giraffes from miles away and they want to be more giraffe. And she's like, that's it. That's it. That's our messaging. That's our marketing messaging. People (laughs) want to be more giraffe. Let's lead with that. You know, so we launched the Standout Academy. And then the whole messaging was like, we help you be more giraffe. We help you rise above the noise, stick your neck out for the right reasons, be heard by your customers, and they fall in love with you for the right reason. Therefore, they buy from you and you're seen as an expert. And that's really, really been the reason why. So while there's a fun element to be more giraffe, there's actually quite a serious message behind it. And especially in this day and age. So yes, I'm wearing a giraffe outfit. Uh, that's to illustrate the point. I've done talks in this giraffe outfit, but while it, it's fun, it's a very serious message. And, you know, if you, if you are going to survive this times, so if you are going to win business, you need, it's not even a wish. You need to be more giraffe and people love it. People now tag me in giraffe photos I was I was on a on one of our so we run a clubhouse room every day midday and this guy who's in America said Elliot I want to tell you something I was like what's that he's like it's your fault I almost got banned from Disney I'm like what do you mean <laughs> because it's completely your fault that I almost got banned from Disney I'm like what are you talking about he goes well I was in Disney and there was a giraffe called Elliot so I leaned, I leant over to try and take a picture of the giraffe and capture the name Elliot. My phone fell into the cage and someone had to go get it. And oh, that is your fault. And I was like, what do you mean that's my fault? But yeah, so there we go. So everyone like they're tagging me in giraffes. People are seeing giraffes. I'm getting people banned from Disney because of giraffes. On Clubhouse, I have my giraffe outfit on, you see, and everyone knows as the, as the guy in the giraffe. But I do want to reiterate, there's a very serious message behind it. So yes, it's fun and memorable, but there's a very serious message behind it. So that's the giraffe outfit, Adam. 
And and yeah, because people are like, what is, you know, first, you know, P Pony Express, because Speaker Express was Pony Express. And now right. it's Speaker Express, but it's Be More Giraffe. Like, you have some strange fetishes. It's like, no, no fetishes. I'm not obsessed with giraffe. I don't know the different types of giraffes. I have no idea what – it's just the messaging. That's it. That's it. It just works. Hashtag Be More Giraffe. That's it. There's nothing else behind it. <laughs> you know, you know, it's really interesting, Elliot, right? So I've got a good friend of mine called Ash Lawrence. You might know Ash. He's kind of like, a, I suppose, a no, no BS type of business coach, but he's been around for like 30 odd years. But he specializes more specifically in, in the kind of psychology uh, realm. And um, he, his new room, actually, and, he, and, he's, and his new strap line is, it's all about, um, what's, the, what's, the, what's the word I'm looking for? I've just lost it. Hang on a second. Turning people into elephants. Right. So I don't know what it is about themes and animals and giraffes. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. I mean, what the there, hell? There's a wave. <laughs> <laughs> there's a wave of, of animals taking over the marketing world, right? Elephants. Uh, someone connected me as well from the Den community recently, and she's got the red giraffe thing going on. I'm be more giraffe. He's be an elephant. And actually, we're going to launch a, a new room, which is to do with being a beast. So uh, there's something going on. I'm telling you, uh, it'll be coming out soon on Clubhouse. Watch, watch out for it. But it, it is, is like, it. yeah, being a beast. So I need to change my picture when I do that room because there's me have a picture in giraffe on Clubhouse. So if I'm doing the beast room, then it won't quite work. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what you could do actually, Elliot. What you could do What's actually that? is you, you could actually turn your clubhouse or your club room into an animal farm. So you have you'd have uh, giraffes, you'd have elephants. You know, freaking long. <laughs> we could do that. We could have the, the the farm room only come in if you're an animal. I don't know. I think I might attract some really strange people uh, exactly. if we went down that line. I'm a bit concerned with that one. I don't know. I don't know. I don't I have to think about that one. I'd rather go with beast before I launch a farm, uh, you know, and we'll go from there. Yeah. I think. Maybe, yeah. Maybe farm is probably not appropriate. Maybe. Not even, not even zoo comes even close to it. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah, I love it, love it, love it, love it. But listen, um, I know we've known each other a long time, actually, and uh, just yeah. I suppose for the benefit of uh, of our audience and stuff. I suppose what I, what they'd probably like to know is like, how did you kind of get into the whole kind of speaking realm? I suppose just to kind of uh, give a little bit of context. Hazel's suggesting Elliot Zoo. Love it, love it, love it. Good I job, love that, man. Elliot Zoo. Yeah, because then you can have Nigel Risner in there because he wrote a book all about animals and different communication styles. And yeah, yeah. anyway, let's let's. So you want to know how I go into speaking? Well, that, that was the question, right? Before I got distracted by Hazel's right. comment. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Into speaking or Speaker Express? Both. Oh, just speaking in general. <clears throat> okay. So before, in a previous, well, let's dial back a little bit. So at the age of 21, I actually decided I wanted to become a professional dancer. So I dropped everything I was doing in my life back then, and I, I actually trained to become a professional dancer. I got a scholarship, and I graduated, and I had a bit of a, a life as a dancer. And then when I was 30, I got injured. This is going somewhere. Follow the thread. Follow the thread. I got injured, found myself in different jobs and things like that. I didn't quite realize as an entrepreneur then, and what happened was I became a trainer, a national trainer for a very big established company that worked with the likes of Sky, Waterstones, Talk Talk. And from there, I wanted to become a better trainer. So I started to study. Um, I was looking for a training that I could do, but I couldn't find anything. So I enrolled in a coaching course. This is going somewhere. And then yeah. uh, what happened was <laughs> as I enrolled in the coaching course, you see the bells were going off all around us. And as I enrolled in a coaching course, I had to work with people's peoples. And then I peoples. That's how giraffes talk, right? That's giraffe talk, yeah. peoples. Yeah. And um I I obviously had to work with people to get qualified. And of course, one of the ways I recommend is to watch other coaches and other speakers. So I went to this uh, event in Ali Pali in London. There were uh -huh. like five thousand people there. It wasn't Tony Robbins before everyone goes, oh, Tony Robbins, it wasn't Tony Robbins. It was that size event. And I just saw this guy speak and completely captivate the audience and completely captivate the room. And I, you know, I stuck out the whole three days and I was like, wow. And of course, I said what most people say and went, I can do that. Uh, and then I did. <laughs> so I did do that. Um, of course, the 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 the, tr the the moving from 
being a dancer. By that point, I hadn't danced for quite a while, but still, I was like, how can it, how hard can it be? I've got over a thousand hours as a dancer, you know, how hard can it be to speak? Well, the answer is to do it at that caliber, that level is very hard. Um, but I was naive, <laughs> arrogant, and a bit silly. So I was like, you know, how hard can it be? Well, actually, it's quite hard. It, it is a hell of a skill when people don't realize it. Everybody can learn it. That is true. And that's how yeah. I started. So I started to do my own talks. I started to get on stage. And then obviously I realized, oh, gosh, I should really train because I really don't know what I'm doing. No one's running to buy from me. People are clapping. They're enjoying me, but nothing's happening commercially. So clearly I'm not doing something right. Right. So then I joined a training company that was uh, an international company and I trained with them. And then I become I became their trainer mm -hmm. for over five years. And I taught the world training for them. Speaker Express was born in one of those training rooms with my business partner at the time, Monique. And that's how I got into it. Love it. And now I've written a book about it as well. So I've really got the I just don't have the T-shirt. yet. But I've got the book, I've got the giraffe outfit. I've got the history. I just don't have the T-shirt. <laughs> 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 love it, love it, love it. Soon you'll have, um, soon you'll, 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 you'll be um, running, uh, you'll be advertising ambassadors and mascots to be more giraffe. Hey, that's a great idea, you know. Yeah, I'm thinking pins. Like you, you, you win a giraffe pin, so you can walk around being I'm, I am more giraffe. I'm thinking commercial merchandise. Don't worry, that's on the plan, Adam. It's on the plan. It's there, it's there. <laughs> Hundred percent, mate. Hundred percent. Listen, that's all good. What's gonna say? I know that you do a lot of uh, work with, um, I suppose, entrepreneurs and smaller business owners more specifically. But I suppose one of the things that really, I suppose, bugs me and really kind of it, it ticks me off more than anything else, and it probably ticks you off, is that everyone's a speaker, right? Everyone's a speaker. Everyone claims to be a speaker, but really. No. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting, right? Sorry, carry on. No, no, no. I was just, it, it is interesting. And I, I, I just, it really, I suppose, it's a bit like, you know, the analogy of everyone's a coach, right? And everyone's a speaker and everyone's a freaking consultant or whatever it is. And it's just like, for me, what really is a really good speaker? What what really kind of, why you type of thing? And it's kind of that, I suppose, this interesting conversation of, you know, why do people do that? I just don't get it. Well, I think if I may split the answer there. I Here's the thing. I released a video, ironically, yesterday saying everybody is a speaker right now. Because, let me qualify that. If you're using a camera, you're speaking. If you're doing lives, you're speaking. If you're on Clubhouse, you're speaking, right? If you're on a Facebook group, you're speaking. If you're using Instagram, you're speaking. So in one sense, everyone is a speaker now, just to go with maybe against what you're saying. I think what you're irked at isn't the fact that everybody's a speaker, is the fact that people claim to be speakers when they're not very good at it or they're not really speakers. They, they haven't invested. And the thing what irks you is people that haven't invested the time and the effort and the money in developing themselves as speakers go out there and call themselves speakers. Yes, that is annoying. However, the, the other thing we need to think of is, A, everybody starts somewhere, right? So I was like, oh, how hard can that be, right? This guy, 5,000 people, I can do that. I did that. I was that guy that irked you, right, that annoyed you, that, that you know. But then I realized quickly that if I'm to be good, if I'm to be world class, if I'm to be a certain level, then I have to invest in my craft. And I think there's a distinction. There's those who, and again, there's speakers. I get paid to speak. I get paid for my expertise. And then there's people who speak to promote their business, to market their business. And they are very different types of speakers. And I think what really gets to you is the the people that haven't invested in their craft, they're not particularly good, but they're going out there claiming that they speak. Is that about, am I right there or have I, mis have I missed the mark? Yeah, I, th I think I think you pretty much, yeah, I think, I think you're pretty much on course there. I, I would agree with what you're saying there, 100%. Cool. So I think then we have to really look at it kind of for what it is. So, yes, is it annoying when people call themselves speakers and they're not and they talk about themselves the whole time and they do nothing to add value? That is highly irritating, not just for you or me as people who are in the space, but for the audience, too. And then right. that then give the people like the, the actual real good speakers, consultants, coaches who are out there doing a great job, a bad rap. Yeah. Um, I think what's really important, I mean, there's several things, because obviously we run rooms on this now, and 
we're, we're all about using your voice for good. We're all about being more giraffe. We're all about, you know, getting yourself out there, be seen, be heard, right? I think what's really important, you know, it's not, it's not for you and I to take that right away from anyone. I think what's important is if you make that dis- decision to stand up, be counted for, and, and, and use speaking, I think what's important is you respect the audience, you respect the listener, you you know, and that's where I think it's important to train. It's important to become skillful at it, right? I I wouldn't open a massage parlor tomorrow and go, hey, because, you know, my wife says I give good massages, right? So I'm going to open a massage tomorrow and become a masseuse. That is <laughs> utterly disrespectful, right? Do you know what I mean? But that's utterly disrespectful that people have studied the skill and the craft. It's the same. You should invest in your speaking. You should invest in your craft, especially if you want to have impact, if you want to enroll people, if you want to be booked again, right, and grow your presence. And I think that's what's important to distinguish is it's cool. Everybody can speak and everybody can call themselves a speaker, but let's respect the craft. Let's respect the profession. Let's give kudos where kudos do. So the fact, I mean, I remember I was talking to some guy on Facebook. He was thinking about, you know, um, working with me. And, and obviously, like, my sweet spot is language impact structure. That's kind of like the, the philosophy, as well as banging the mic as I talk, as you can see, because I'm quite animated. Um, <laughs> and he's like, but, you know, Elia, if, don't you think if you have a structure, it stifles the flow and creativity? It's like, no, on the contrary, structure gives you freedom, right? We have a spine that doesn't stop us from walking, does it? right? It doesn't stop us from, the, the structure is the spine of your talk. And again, that's what I mean. Like people go, no, I just need to be in my flow. I just need to stand there and see what comes to me. Great. I'm so happy you're a channeler, but that is utterly terribly disrespectful to the listener because you don't know what's going to come out your mouth. They don't know what's going to come out your mouth. And often it becomes self-indulgent, right? LinkedIn user, love the outfit. Regards from Sweden. Thank you, LinkedIn user, whose name good. I can't see. You think it's who? <laughs> I think it's Stefan, uh, Stefan uh, Tonin. Uh, he's uh, he's uh, one of our uh, uh, one of our fans, I suppose, and, oh, and uh, works in the HR space and a bloody good one. Oh, thank you, thank you. I'm glad <laughs> you like the outfit, and I hope I'm making my point. So yeah, I think that's that's where it's annoying. Like you know, there's nothing worse than showing up, and you know you. you that people are booked to see you. They're giving up time to see you, whether they've paid or it's free. And you're like, oh, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to see what comes out. No, you don't show up to a marathon and go, I'm just going to run. I mean, some people do. And we know how far they get, right? But, <laughs> you know, it, it's just like it, people have to understand that this is a craft. It's a skill. And you need to respect people's time. Like, yes, that part, I'm yeah. with you. I'm I'm an annoyed giraffe right now. I'm, I'm totally annoyed at with, with what we're discussing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting. You, you, you know, we, we, we kind of like, you know, even people, um, even people think like, you know, I can get away with just winging it, right? It's like, because that's what you're kind of, you're, you're, you're trying to say is people just go on, on a stage, whether it be on a clubhouse, whether it be on a virtual stage or whatever it is, but winging it, right? And improvisation without really kind of, having some sort of structure or some sort of, uh, what's the word, an organized an organized structure to be able to kind of move from is disrespectful from the audience. And I would totally agree with what you're saying, 100%, definitely yeah. 100%, because you could just end up walking, right? Exactly, exactly. I mean, it's, look, it's a, what I talk, when I say have a structure, right, we teach a, a cool seven-step structure. It gives you the freedom yeah. to express. Doesn't mean you're not going to go wrong. Doesn't mean you won't go off script sometimes. And I'm not, I hate scripts. Just for the record, I'm not talking about scripting your talk. I am completely anti-scripts, right? What I'm talking about is having a, 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 like a road to get to where you need to get to, right? Uh, and you know that road's going to lead you. You might go a little bit left. You might go a little bit right here. But the road goes where you need to get to. And that's my point. It doesn't stifle the flow or the creativity enhances it. If you're not willing to invest in the skill and the craft that is you know, to become a better speaker, whether you use it for marketing or as a speaker, then don't call yourself a speaker. You know, be someone who talks sometimes, you know, but you're not, you're not a speaker. Right. Let's be honest. Of course, we're all speakers. We all speak, but you get my point. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Question. Um, 
interesting point here. I, I suppose we all like to teach in particular ways or we like to speak in different ways. Are there different ways in which you can speak? And, and uh, um, I suppose, how does one know how to execute in a particular way? So let me give an example, Elia. Like yeah. for me, I'm an animated speaker. But I like to I like to I like to get the audience involved purely because if I'm just there lecturing people, yeah, it kind of is it just like I'm speaking to a mirror or a brick wall. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. It does. And I've seen you speak and it does often come across like a mirror or a brick. No, I'm only joking, Adam. Of course it doesn't. You're a great speaker. I'm only <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> Yes, I've got, there's different deliveries, and I think there's different speakers for different audiences. And again, when you invest in the craft, you learn to adapt that, right? So let's take, like, Tony Robbins can walk into an accountant's conference and get them jumping and going crazy because of who he is, his name and reputation. Yep. Not a lot of people can walk in and do that, right? So it's really knowing your audience and knowing how to adapt your presentation style. So, of course, there's kind of your motivational, upbeat, high-energy delivery, right, which a lot of people attempt to mimic, and then they underestimate how hard that is to maintain because they go, oh, you know, I saw Tony Robbins. How hard can it be? He does it for four days. Well, now three. Well, actually, yeah. his, his throat is all shot now. But, you know, it's hard work carrying 10,000 people. Um, but even that style, the upbeat, the energy, the high, you know, you need to learn how to do that. So that's actually an archetype, the motivational archetype. Then you've got the educator archetype, which is where most people speak right. from, which is your edge, you know, which is really what you're talking about, my information coming from me to you, right? And it's one way. What you really need yeah. to do is find a blend. There's of, of course, there's kind of um your channeler, those are the guys, you know, who really channel the talk but they know what they're talking about there's the caregiver which is like oprah right who really sits there and goes through the emotions with people when she talks she takes the story she takes on these stories like oh you're crying with her right so i th yeah. there are different <laughs> deliveries that was true right uh, unless unless you're megan and harry being interviewed and that the, the tears will probably wow. post that but that's a different conversation <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, so, you know, <laughs> your your educator kind of uh, speaker is is kind of very good, almost for the corporate environment. But the thing is, here's, here's what I will say. If the talk's not experiential, they're less likely to, 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 to really d process the information. If they're not involved in any way and you're just blah, 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 right, I, I can watch a YouTube video about this. I, I can... I can go on Clubhouse and listen to someone speaking, right? The audience needs to be the third person in the room, so to speak. Like, it needs to be conversational. If you want to be more giraffe and you want to stand out, right, you can be ostrich and put your head in the sand and be like everyone else. However, it's important that they're involved <laughs> in the conversation and they feel a part. And the other way, of course, to be more giraffe and to really enroll them is storytelling because – People retain 22% more information when you use stories. So even in the corporate environment, even very serious environments, you know, stories is essential. And this year as I work with MD CEOs, I work with investors, people raising investment. And I've always talked about the importance of story. And they're like, what do you mean? I, I just want to raise a few million pounds. I'm like, if you use story, you're more likely to do it. And like, why is that? Why is that? What are you talking about? I've always, it's always worked. I'm like, listen, if you just go in and go, hi, my name's Elliot Kay. I'm looking for two million pounds. Here's the data. Here's the concept. Here's the data. You'll sound like everyone else. But if you use a story and yeah. you enroll them first, you'll you'll break the barriers down. You'll warm them up as long as you tell a good story, right? So, and that's another important part of this. If you understand the importance of stories, you understand the importance of the audience. And you understand the de delivery styles of how to deliver, which is authentic to you, right? You you will be world class. You will stand out. You will be more giraffe, right? A hundred percent. Question: Is there is yes. there a, is there a right or wrong? Because you talked about like deliver deliverable the different deliveries of, of of speaking and stuff. But is there a right or a wrong way of doing something? I think that can, well, it's a very interesting question because it can be very subjective, right? I mean, I can only share my opinion. Yeah, I mean, is, is there wrong things? Yes. Antagonizing the audience, um, unless you're a preacher and they've gone to your church or your synagogue or your mosque, I think is wrong. Like if someone's going to come and see me speak, I'm going, you guys are a bunch of shit. You're terrible. 
you know, you'll never be giraffes. You'll, you'll, you'll always be uh, little, little tiny mouses. Like, I, I don't think, I mean, personally, <clears throat> I think that's wrong, right? <laughs> I don't think that's the right way to do things. Yeah, there's certain things, you know, uh, manipulation I feel is wrong when you manipulate the audience into making a decision um, is wrong. Yeah. I think lying on stage to gain sales is wrong. So is there a wrong way to speak? You know, I, I can't, I can't say that all i can do is give my opinion of what i feel could be the wrong way to do things and again results speak for themselves if you're not getting the results you want if you're not getting the reaction from the audience you're on if you're not getting the sales you need or the rebookings you want we we'll just take that off for now right then you're doing something wrong <laughs> we like that <laughs> okay we can bring it back up we can bring it back up there we go here he is Gigi the giraffe is back <laughs> There you go. Just for you, Adam. Just for you. How many people are just up for? <laughs> yeah. So that that's what I will say about wrong, if you know what I mean. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, you brought up some really interesting points because us working in the personal development arena, uh, but then, you know, there, there, there are different ways in which you can speak. Like you've got the big con uh, corporate conferences. You, you've got the uh, kind of the more formal ones where, you know, you might be set aside, I don't know, Seth Godin, at some some marketing um, sort of yeah. campaign or whatever. I suppose there's different, like you said, there's different deliveries, there's different audiences, and there's different ways in which you can, I suppose, get your message out there in a way, isn't there? Yeah. I mean, I remember years ago, I was, I was doing this talk. It was in London, uh, and it, there was like 60 quite highly qualified business owners. And two things I did wrong. <laughs> One, I didn't ask enough questions about the level of the business owners. Because yeah. I remember, the first thing I went, okay, who here runs a business expecting only a few hands to go up? And pretty much all the hands went up. And I'm like, who here's a million over? And most of the hands went up. And that threw me because I'm like, oh, my talk. Like, I wasn't expecting that. My talk wasn't designed for a million plus business owners. I carried on with the talk. But the other thing I, I really should have paid attention to is how they were responding to the style I was delivering at. And I did go in big, motivational, yeah. yes or no, people, give my hands up. Da, da, da. And I just ended up pissing most of the audience <laughs> off, to be completely honest. And this was very much the early days of, of my speaking. And, you know, they came up with me after that. Like, I really like you, Elliot, but, you know, next time you speak, can, can we, can we, and not just one person, like, it's quite a few people were like, yeah, let, let's turn it down, please. You know, how, how let's turn it down. I was like, okay, I will, I will, promise. So, yeah, that, that was a good lesson for me about doing things wrong. But my intention wasn't wrong. I didn't lie. I didn't manipulate, but I just didn't do a couple of things right there. And I think there's this question here from Stefan. Yeah, good point. How can you absolutely? Keep your so it story? says, uh, I, uh, "Go on." We'll bring that up so the so the rest of you guys can see it. That's a good picture, Stefan. You look good there. I've got to say, I wish I had a picture that I look really good. <laughs> look strong. Oof, now I feel very giraffey. How can you keep your story consistent if you give the same talk several times in the year? Keep it engaging. I admire people that can tell the same story exactly the same time. And time again, great question, Stefan. Let me answer that. Number one, no talk is ever the same. So the energy, the audience is never the same. Therefore, the feeling and the energy behind the story is different. Having, you know, I do tell the same stories again and again. And it, that is part of the challenge of being a speaker, right? Because you need to find that depth and the ability to give it life, to lease it in a way that the audience don't know that you've told it for a thousand times. And that's where having what we would uh, we would call having like a speaker toolkit that you can emotionally dip into and dip out a bit like an actor. But we're not all about we're not about acting. I'm about being present. So it's about being present to the feeling, not acting the feeling. Yeah. So it doesn't matter the story you're telling. It is about dipping into your speaker toolkit, pulling out the emotions you need to make it come to life and putting it back again. And because no talk is the same, no audience the same. Actually, very rarely does it feel like you're doing the same thing again and again and again. And I hope that answers your question. Let me know if it answers your question, Stefan, um, because that's what I found. You actually, to tell. Interesting. I was going to ask you a question, actually, earlier, in, in regards to it, what we got related to what Stefan had actually said. 
how is it to have maybe sort of four or five different stories that you could pretty much recycle over and over and again? Um, how important is that? Very. So there's five key five key stories you, you should be able to tell as a speaker, right? And you, you can either recycle them or have depth in each one. So there's the credibility story, like what gets you to stand there as the person speaking. There's your personal story. And of course, that has lots of depth. But what's important with your personal story it's it's telling the right part of your personal story that's appropriate to the audience. Now, you always tell your personal yes. story from a healed scar, not an open wound, right? So credibility, personal story. <clears throat> then there's your business origin idea, so or your business story is another one. Then there's your success story or case studies. And then there's your vision and or mission, right? So if you're able to clearly, succinctly tell those individually, now I know most people can tell that all five in one story, the idea is to have a toolkit of stories. And then you, you collect stories that are appropriate for your audience. So that's where you might pick on, depends on your audience, but, you know, Stefan might use three HR guru stories and he might just have some people, if it's the Stefan you were talking about, I don't know, I'm guessing, right? Uh, he might pull on Elon Musk's story and he might pull a this story. And what you do is you collect a range of stories, preferably that not everybody else is telling, but again, it depends on what story you're telling and your audience. And then you have a bank of stories you can pull up. So even if you're to summarize them here and there, just to add layers to your talk, that will make all the difference. Uh, so it's very yeah. important. Honestly, if you want to be more Gerald, right, in all seriousness, and you want to stand out from the rest, become a great storyteller, right? And yep. one thing no one can ever compete with you on is your personal story. Now, it's finding the relevancy of the personal story to the audience. Now, for some people, it's just not appropriate. It's just not the right thing to tell, which is why you've got the other stories to share. Yeah, good. some good points there. It, it's an interesting question more than anything else. It go into many different ways. Uh, yeah. Stefan's asked, last question, how did... How did you coach and advise clients in this pandemic? Did you did your approach change? I suppose it must have changed, didn't it, Elliot? Going from kind of more live one-on-one -on -one stuff, group stuff, into kind of more virtual stuff. Yeah, the change we had was the change that we all experienced, right? My approach didn't change, actually, because language impact structure is something that I've been able to very easily translate online. So wow. when I've done my signature talk training, the coaching, all the trainings, because I have obviously accelerators and stuff that I teach, um, I was able to adapt that very quickly because it's a facilitation process. So I, I would, you know, when I do my trainings, I set up the training and then people go away and do it. And then they come back and, uh, and either present it or we discuss what they did. <clears throat> so what changed, obviously, is how how I enrolled people so the marketing changed and of course the delivery mechanism changed because we used to obviously have boardrooms live in London I'm not in London anymore but we would still have them if not um trainings were live you know in hotel ho hotel rooms not in boardrooms in hotels not hotel rooms that sounds really bad um and uh, <laughs> so that's changed. but my approach has been the same <laughs> my approach has been the same um because it's a facilitation process and that's why it stayed the same. So, and that's why I was able to adapt a lot easier, I think, than a lot of people. Um, and even my speaking hasn't changed that much. Uh, obviously I'm speaking to camera, but how I deliver the energy behind it. And sometimes if I need to do it standing up, I'll do it standing up and I've got the equipment for that. I've got a little clip on mic. So that's what changed, but my approach in itself didn't. And that doesn't have to be your last question, Stefan. You can ask as many questions as you want. So <laughs> <laughs> By the way, interesting one here, because I know that speaking, whether it be audio, whether it be speaking um, like we're doing through live stream, but also speaking in a, I suppose, a live masterclass, whether it be in a small group, large group, how do they differ in terms of how to get the message across? You know, how, do, how does one adapt? Because, you know, there's so many more virtual events happening right now, and I, I suppose, you know, people aren't so confident speaking in virtually than they are maybe face to face. How does that differ? And, and any sort of advice there? Yeah, <laughs> it is very different. We can't pretend <laughs> it's no, no yeah. it's exactly the same. Well, it's not. You don't get the live <laughs> response. You're not standing in front of an audience. So it is very different. I think there's some key things that you need to do. So A, to set yourself up to be the best. 
um, and B, to leave impact. So number one, I always say to people is half an hour before your talk, get into zone, get into, you know, sit down, get grounded. Now, however you're going to present, you know, get grounded in that. You know, if you're stand up, get yourself into it. Like, like you would before going on stage. You know, I used to take an hour out, right. <clears throat> get myself ready, go through my routine. And then, because what a lot of people do is they finish an email, click on the Zoom link and they're speaking. It's like, no, 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 no. Your mind isn't present yet. Not good. Not good. Right. That's the first one. The second one is get tech savvy and have a plan B. So get good cameras, get good mics, you know, get good lighting and also test things in case, because if you can't log in, it's not the same as the slides not working in a live. If you can't log in, there's no talk. <laughs> You're no, you cannot deliver it, right? You, it, it's not something you can wing. So you've got to have a plan B about that. Can you use your phone? Can you do things? That's the other thing I would say. <clears throat> the other thing I'd say, of course, is is to embed engagement into the talk. So things like give me a why in the chat room, give me a woohoo every second or third slide or every every few minutes. Give me a thumbs up, right? And the reason I encourage people to type in the chat room is means they're focused in uh, and they're listening to me and they're responding. So that keeps yeah. them engaged. The other thing to remember is um, energy, right? your energy drops a lot quicker on camera. So if you're not energetic and you start to fade, that is like 10 times worse on the other side. So find the way to keep the, keep the energy up, not loud, the energy up. You can be a soft speaker, but highly energized. So right. really learn to monitor your energy. The other thing I would say is tonality. Um, learn the different parts of your tone. So your audio part of your tone, your visual part of your tone and your kinesthetic part of your tone. And I'll give you a quite, just a little moment there. So your visuals up here. Hi, my name is Elliot Kay. I'm all energized here and I want to get everybody up in energy and keep the energy up. That's my visual. And that's where we normally start to tell stories from, but to speak here for an hour is really exhausting, right? So that's the visual part of your voice. The auditory part of your voice is where I am now. That's the middle part. And that's where you teach from. That's where you make your points from. And that's where you sell from, right? And then there's the kinesthetic where you drop down and you want people <laughs> to think about what you just said. So you go, think about that for a minute. And that's just the lower part of your voice. Now, the more you can play with that, actually, the more engaging you are and the more interesting it is to the ear. Um, I also highly ask for people to be on video because I draw energy from that. Unless there's an issue, I don't force anyone, but I tell people about, because you wouldn't go to an event and put a bag on your head. You just wouldn't. So why would you show up to an event and stay off camera, <laughs> right? So again, that's a thing I ask, but uh, you know, I, I don't. Um, and the thing is also when you're looking at camera is either to put a picture of someone behind it that makes you feel happy and warm inside or what I do is I picture that I'm speaking to 100 people live and they're all smiling and responding to what I'm saying. So I use a little bit of my my mind to, to kind of keep the energy up because I've done talks with hundreds of people and it's just impossible to see all the faces. So what I do is I have a few faces that I can see and I use them. But then when I'm scrolling across, I just imagine they're all going, yeah, man, it's amazing. Woo, woo, woo. Whether they are or not is another matter. But in my mind, they are. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And then at the end of it, and actually some of the feedback I've always got is highly energetic, really engaging, you know, great value. And and that's because of what I've just shared with you. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting. I remember, I remember when I first got into the speaking world, Elliot, right? And uh, in fact, I think it was, I was at a personal development event, right? One of the, and the audience asked uh, one of the speakers a question, right? And the question was, what do I need to do if I'm nervous and I'm on stage, what do I need to imagine? And you know what the speaker turned around and said? Please don't tell turn me he said to see everyone naked. <laughs> no, yeah, you know what he said? He said, he said, just imagine everyone's naked. I went, what? No. Everyone's naked? Oh, does that really you work? You know, someone, well, someone's, someone said that in our club room um, yesterday, and obviously I didn't want to upset the, the, the energy because we had great energy. I think that's awful advice. Yeah, yeah. And I'll tell you why. Because you're nervous, <laughs> and then you're picturing everyone naked. So yes, you're distracted, but now you're 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 sitting there seeing men with their dongas hanging out, and women with their clungers hanging out. I'm like, that's just that, that's just not good here. Like, and then if if there's someone really hot there, like you know, depending on your preference, 
you're then picturing them naked and then you're distracted thinking how hot they would look naked. I'm not present to the talk. And then I'm introducing sexual energy into the room. It's just not good advice. I'm terribly sorry. I just don't think think of everyone naked is a good advice. Or think everyone in their underwear. It's just bad. It's just not good advice. There's other ways. You can, you know, there's various tools and techniques that are far more effective than thinking of everyone naked. You know, now everybody's thinking of everybody naked. Who's like, is Elliot naked? No, I'm not naked. I'm in a draft outfit. But yes. So I think that's I think that's wrong advice. There you go. Is do people do things wrong? You know yes, that's wrong. That, <laughs> that was so funny. I just had this. Um, I just had this uh, aha moment, right? This kind of epiphany. This was going back quite a few number of years, right, Elliot? I think I was in. I was speaking actually at this particular event, but I was kind of listening into the audience. I can't remember her name anyway, but I remember she got us to turn around. Okay, Elliot and got us to close our eyes and as we turned around literally she was on stage in her knickers and bra and okay. she was trying to get a, get a point across about you know if you're speaking on the stage this is what you need to imagine and stuff like that i'm like okay you you didn't have to physically take all your clothes off to emphasize a point i just don't get that right <laughs> and, and here's the thing let's be honest at that moment when you turn around did you go, oh, yeah, that's such a great speaking lesson? Or did you go, she's in her bra and underwear? And then you're going, and then you're paying attention to what was in her bra and underwear. So it completely <laughs> takes away from the point she's trying to make. That is not good. That's just not, I'm sorry. In oh my, my world, God. that is just not good training, right? It's just not good. I know if I turn around and the teacher is, I would be looking at what's kind of, you know, that's just what I'd be looking at. The bits. I'd be going, oh, well, bits, is she, is she clean shaven? Is she not? Like, that's what I'd be looking at. It's just, <laughs> and I'm not thinking about speaking anymore. So it's true. I'm not, well, I'm not nervous anyway. But you get my point, I think. But you know what? I, I said, I just thought to myself, do you know what? Fair play to her. She's got the balls to be able to go up on stage in her knickers and bra in front of loads of people, take my hat off to oh, her. But 100%. I'm, a hundred percent. Look, when I was a dancer, I did a whole monologue taking my clothes off to my underwear. I get it, <laughs> right? But I just don't think that's the greatest way to train, you know? Yeah. Uh, if I'm standing there and there's a hundred people in the room and I'm nervous, I want a coping mechanism, not a distraction. Yeah. And thinking of someone naked is a distraction. It's not a coping mechanism. Because the moment I'm not speaking about them naked, I'm going, oh, shit, I'm still nervous. So you haven't really <laughs> solved the problem. Or, or you're nervous because now you're thinking of this really hot person naked. And you go, oh, my God, they're really hot. And they, oh, you know, it's just no. That's, that's a no-no in my book. <laughs> love it. It's love a big no-no. 100%. 100%. Listen, this is, this, is, this is a cracking conversation, guys. If you are listening to the recording of this, by the way, please make sure that you uh, give us a, a comment or through social media or whatever it is. If you want to engage with me and Elliot, if you have a question, and feel free to do and engage with us because we've had some we've had a great laugh tonight we really have and uh yeah you know it's just it's just really it's, really it's just a really interesting conversation right literally for me right when i do these shows elliot right for me because i've i've got a lot of experience in in doing these types of things like and, yeah. and i know you pretty well pretty well anyway so i can get away with kind of improvising a little bit but you know what <laughs> it's free flow and you know what I mean? And it kind of works out for, for, for me. But for most people, it, it pretty much doesn't go free flow. It doesn't go <laughs> kind of in that kind of direction as such. But um, that's all good. Listen, I suppose a lot of final question to you really is, what are you working on right now? Because I know that you've done your speak and sell uh, book. Mm -hmm. You're on Clubhouse every day. I'd love to know more, more details about that. Yeah, there's your book up there. But uh, yep. let, what, what are you working on for 21? We've just launched a new masterclass, actually, Speak and Sell with Impact. So we're working on that. That kicks off next week, and that will be going on an ongoing basis. Um, so if anyone wants to find out information about that, uh, how, how do they do that? They connect with me, or what do they do? We'll, I don't put, know. We'll, put we'll, we'll put a link below. We'll put a link up. Okay, great. So connect with me. I am working on my fifth book this year as well, and more, more to Ooh. follow on that. So I'm excited Ooh. about that. And it'll be very different from my normal books. Like I've written four, so this will be the fifth. Uh, and it will be kind of a Be More Giraffe type book. So it'll be different. Um, I've just got a new investor in the business. So we're really tweaking uh, the kind of look, the feel of the brand, the positioning of the brand as well. Uh, yeah. And for those who want to join us on Clubhouse, um, it's every day, Monday to Friday, 12 o'clock UK time. Uh, and what we do is we talk public speaking, training techniques, various things. 
Um, just follow me. I am Elliot K is my clubhouse handle. I do have a club, Stand Out and Win Business, as well. Um, and I co-host the room with a, with a cool guy called Jose Ucar. Jose, he's the man with the baseball cap and the accent. I don't know why what, what accent that was meant to be. It's meant to be South American, but that was really not South American. So I apologize <laughs> to anyone that I just did that for. You should, you should get him on. He'll be a great fun, actually, Adam. If you can, I'll introduce you. He'll be good on this as well. Um, so, yeah, that's... I was just going to say, I'll, I'll, if I get the opportunity, I'll come into your clubhouse uh, if you're doing it every day. Is it every day? Every well, Monday to Friday, yeah. So come in, uh, we'll bring me up on stage as well. So, yeah, that's what I'm working on. I mean, there's loads of stuff I, I'm working on new mastermind and things like that, which will be launched in due course. Um, what you know, with a new investor coming in, it, it we're just refining now everything and getting our, our kind of strategy right. So, it's exciting times, but those are the immediate things I'm working with on. And I think, yeah, I mean, also, I think if people want to kind of know how influential they are they can take our, my assessment. Again, I'll give you the link and we can put it below. Um, Sounds good. And that gives them like a report and a score and all that malarkey. I'm, I'm not selling giraffe outfits yet or merchandise, but watch out for that. Listen, we should, have, we should create a waiting list for uh, people that want to sign up for giraffe merchandise. If you are interested, please make sure that you either uh, – <laughs> Please give us a tag on social media or drop, or drop a uh, DM <laughs> to uh, a Facebook, LinkedIn, or on Instagram. <laughs> exactly, I'm sure, exactly. I'm sure that if he gets enough demand for it, guys, he'll make it happen, whatever it is. I know what Elliot's like. Yeah, so but only if there's pre-orders, okay? I'm not, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not doing it until there's at least a 1,000 pre-orders, okay? Just, just saying, <laughs> just putting it out there. And then we'll create the Be More Giraffe merchandise. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sounds good. Listen, I just want to say thanks very much for being on the show today. Really enjoyed our conversations. And you, for you guys, I hope you've enjoyed uh, our conversations today on the show. If you want to meet, reach out to, to Elliot, uh, you can follow him on Clubhouse, of course. Uh, I am Elliot K on uh, Clubhouse. And remember, uh, Clubhouse is the audio only app on iOS and Apple. And he hosts a show at 12 o'clock Monday to Friday. Uh, that's GMT. You can also follow myself on Clubhouse as well. We do two rooms a week on a Tuesday and a Friday. Generally is around in the evening. Generally is around 7 p.m. UK time. We uh, we also have a club room called No BS, No Ego, because I'm <laughs> fed up with hearing all of the other so-called zillionaires and billionaires that you can uh, become in less than two weeks, which we know is complete and utter bullshit. Um, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so um, <laughs> do, you like that? do you like that name, Elliot? I do, I do, and it's very you, Adam. I've got, I've got to give it to you. <laughs> I am, I am going to be launching another room called Beast Mode On, and I think I'll invite you into that room. I may, I, I mean, I mean, I'm sold, absolutely, hundred percent. Beast Mode On, I love it, love it, love it. Listen, guys, <laughs> I hope you enjoy the show. Feel free to connect with myself and Elliot on uh, social media. Otherwise, uh, have a fantastic day, week, month, whenever you're listening to this, and we'll speak to you soon. Take care from me and Elliot. Cheers now. Bye now, bye. Hey, you guys, I just want to say thank you so much for listening in to this episode of the Game Changers Experience. I hope that you got some amazing value, some great insights and golden nuggets that you can implement into your business straight away. I would really, really appreciate it if you could leave a five star review on the button below. Have a fantastic day and we'll see you on the next episode. Take care.